Hello everyone. This is the CircuitPython weekly meeting for September the 26th, 2022. This is the time of the week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. My name is Tim and I am sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. CircuitPython is a version of Python that is designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. The CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support them and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel, uh, as well as the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically occurs on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific time, except when that co coincides with a US holiday. In the notes doc, there is a link to a calendar you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. Uh, we also send notifications about upcoming meetings via Discord. If you'd like to receive those notifications, ask us to add you to the at CircuitPythonistas role on Discord. There is a notes document that accompanies the meeting and recording. The notes document contains timestamps to go along with the video so that you can use the doc to view only the parts of the video that interest you most. The meeting tends to run uh, 30 to 90 minutes, so this gives you an option to skip around if you like. After each meeting, we post a link to the next meeting's notes document in the CircuitPython dev channel on the Adafruit Discord. Check the pinned messages to find the latest notes doc so you can add your notes for the following meeting. Uh, if you wish to participate but cannot attend, you can leave hug reports and status updates in the document for us to read during the meeting. Um, and that document tends to go up uh, within a day or so after this meeting concludes, so you are free to start filling that stuff in early. You don't have to wait until Mondays to put your status updates and your hug reports in. Uh, you can put those in throughout the week as they come to mind. This meeting is going to be held in five parts. The first part is community news. This is a look at all things CircuitPython and Python on hardware in the community. It's a preview of our Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. The second part is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. This is a statistical overview of the entire project. It's a chance to look at the project by the numbers, separate from what we're all up to. The third part, and first of our two round robins, is Hug Reports. Hug Reports is an opportunity to highlight the good things that folks are doing, take some time to recognize the awesome folks in our community and beyond. The fourth part is Status Updates. Status Updates is an opportunity to sync up on what we've been up to, Take a couple of minutes to talk about what you've been doing since the last week and what you'll be up to in the next week until the next meeting. The fifth and final parts is In the Weeds. Uh, in the Weeds is an opportunity for more long form discussion. These discussions can come out of status updates or they can be something identified ahead of time as too long for status updates. So that covers how the meeting will go. Uh, so with that, I will get started on community news. Uh, and in the news pipeline this week, we've got um, first item is mainline Python 3.14 is predicted to be faster than C++. Um, so in about a month, there will be a new yearly release of Python. This will be version 3.11. The main feature for this version is a significant increase in speed. People are testing the new version and their results are stunning. Uh, extrapolating, keeping at this pace, uh, it's estimated that Python 3.14 will be faster than C++. To be exact, the loop time will be uh, 0.232 seconds. So it will be done just before you want to do the calculation. And there's a link here uh, that goes to towardsdatascience.com with an article uh, explaining and expanding upon this. Uh, next up, we have Adafruit Penguin. Um, this is a newly released tool uh, and guide that shows you how to use any font inside of EagleCAD software. So Autodesk's Eagle software, this is the PCB design software favored around Adafruit. It has a problem. The circuit boards it produces, while perfectly functional, are somewhat ugly uh, with vintage plotter-like text and no support for custom fonts. Penguin is a Python script that substitutes true type fonts for Eagle's ugly plotter stroke text. It's open source software and you can learn more at a recently published guide on the Adafruit learning system. There's a link to that in the notes doc. Uh, next up is 
a uh, Tandy TRS-80 Model 100 retrofit. Uh, this is uh, a project detailing the retrofitting of a vintage Tandy TRS-80 Model 100 portable device. Uh, this project is using a Raspberry Pi. Uh, the first step is to utilize the keyboard. The uh, Raspberry Pi Pico, excuse me, Raspberry Pi Pico uh, is running CircuitPython and being used to decode the keyboard matrix. Uh, next up, uh, actually, we'll be using a Raspberry Pi computer and a modern color display. So if you're interested in this project, there is a link over to uh, GitHub with more information about that. Next up is uh, Iguana, a programming environment for MicroPython. Iguana is an, an evolving IDE for MicroPython on Windows. Iguana contains a code editor based on the ACE project, a terminal with REPL, a file manager, a downloader, ESP tool, uh, and allows you to work with MicroPython via Wi-Fi and USB. There are links to GitHub as well as RoboStart uh, website if you'd like to learn more about this new MicroPython IDE called Iguana. Uh, and rounding out the community news this week and continuing with IDE news, uh, there have been two new features added to the CircuitPython Online IDE. Two features that Riverwing has promised for the CircuitPython Online IDE have been added. One of them is a file modification indicator. Uh, the other is a true serial mode indicator showing whether the microcontroller is in REPL or running a script. There are links to Twitter and github.io uh, the page where the IDE is hosted directly. So if you'd like to learn more about those new features, or if you'd like to give that CircuitPython online IDE a try, you can follow those links from the notes doc. Um, and thank you to, I think it was Jeff perhaps, for posting those in the chat for us. Uh, and that wraps up our newsletter items for this week. So as a reminder to folks, all of these items and many more came from the CircuitPython weekly newsletter. This is a CircuitPython community run newsletter that's emailed every Tuesday. The complete archives are available on adafruitdaily.com. It highlights the latest Python uh, on hardware related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, Python, and MicroPython developments. To contribute your own news or products, projects, you can edit next week's draft on GitHub. Uh, you can submit a pull request with your changes. Um, or if you are not so familiar with GitHub, you could also tag a tweet with hashtag CircuitPython on Twitter or email cpnews at adafruit.com. Uh, and of course, a uh, hug report to Anne for uh, gathering all of these newsletter items and getting the newsletter uh, published for us week to week. So next up is the state of CircuitPython, the libraries in Blinka. Uh, this is a statistical overview of the entire project by the numbers. It gives us a chance to look at the health of the project separate from what we're all up to. We'll talk about the project overall and then separately discuss the core, the libraries, and Blinka. So first up, I will talk about the overall section this week. Uh, this week across all CircuitPython repos, we had 34 pull requests merged by 17 authors, uh, which is amazing. That feels certainly um, higher than normal, at least to my recollection. Um, a couple of the names that were newer folks, uh, perhaps less frequent contributors, or maybe even just people that I don't happen to recognize, uh, but these folks may be new or less frequent, so thank you to them. Uh, Bill88T. Uh, Alex Sporn, um, RTW Fruity, S OL, uh, Schnurma, and W T U E M U R A. I don't know the pronunciation on that one. I apologize. But thank you to all of those folks, as well as all of the rest of our contributors across CircuitPython and the libraries and related repos this week. Um, we had 11 total reviewers this week, and that does look mostly like the usual suspects, so thank you to all of our reviewers for continuing to uh, help us get PRs reviewed and merged. We had 27 closed issues by 11 people and 14 opened by 11 people. Uh, so we're down a decent chunk of issues for the week. Um, and so next up, we will talk about the core a bit. And uh, if you're available, Jeff, I'll pass it over to you to tell us about that. 
Happy to. So the core is the part of CircuitPython that's implemented in C, and you typically put it on your device as a UF2 file. And um, within the last week, we had 11 pull requests merged from eight authors. And I'll recognize Bill 88T again, uh, S-O-L, W-T Umura, or however that's pronounced, and Snakey Maker Cat as less common reviewers. And I just want to jump back up to reviewers. Really appreciate seeing uh, Liz in that list, Blitz City DIY. So I know you're um, getting up to speed and happy to see you in that list. Anyway, back to the core. We've got 19 open pull requests. And the first seven of those have been open for a long time. They are waiting for the next step. And if you are waiting on us, core developers, please give us a ping on those so we can help you. Other than that, we've got a bunch of pull requests that are under 20 days, so that's pretty good, including a couple that are open zero days. Issues-wise, we have 17 closed issues by nine people and eight open by seven people. Uh, so we're down a little bit on issues, and it's always nice to see that. We have a total of 570 open issues, but we organize those according to milestones. And right now, the milestone to keep your eye on is the 800 milestone. We have 33 open issues we would like to resolve before we release a stable version of CircuitPython 8. Um, and we've got four issues not assigned a milestone, so uh, somebody needs to take a look at those, probably me or Dan, and assign them. And um, happy to see the milestone counts back. Um, Hug report to whoever that was that re-added them, early hug report. So anyway, uh, narrative-wise, our focus is on moving towards the stable release of version 8, which is what it's been for quite some time. And last week, uh, Dan and Katni and I all met and went through the open issues that were tagged 800. We transferred some of them to 8xx, which is a new milestone. Those are minor bugs or uh, improvements that we don't want to hold version 8 for. And others we move to long term, which means Adafruit doesn't prioritize them right now, although we're happy for anyone to pick up one of those issues and work on them. Um, yeah, so stay tuned. Help us test out 8.0, report problems if you run into them, help us fix the issues, and uh, we will get there when we get there. And that is how things are going on the core. Thank you, Tectric. Excellent. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, next up, I'll send it over to Katni to tell us about the libraries. Thanks, Tim. This section applies to all the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries, which is everything that starts with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, as well as a few extras like our community bundle and our cookie cutter. So this week, across all those repositories, we had 19 pull requests merged from nine different authors, including a couple of the names that were read off above, and eight different reviewers. I want to point out that two of those merged pull requests were 54 days old and 163 days old. So I'm really excited to see that we're still tracking away at the older uh, PRs. And we're keeping up with new ones. Very, very good. So that leaves us with 37 open pull requests. In terms of issues, we had nine closed by two people and four opened by three people, leaving us with 596 open issues. 133 of those are good, labeled good first issue. If you're interested in contributing to Python on the Python, <laughs> CircuitPython on the Python side of things, check out circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find all the information posted here and more, um, including open pull requests, uh, the list of open issues, um, and uh, some library uh, infrastructure issues as well. If you are interested in reviewing, check out the open pull requests. See whether there's anything you have hardware for, test it if you do. Uh, if you do not, take a look at the code, see what you can see. If there's syntax issues or um, cleanup to be done, uh, leave a comment, let us know. And once you're comfortable with that, uh, we can talk about leveling you up to the review team. If you're interested in contributing code or documentation, check out the open issues. There are many of them. Um, but you can they're listed out by repositories so you can sort of go through them and the titles are, are all available there so you can go through them and see if anything strikes your fancy if you are new to everything good first issue is is a good label to start with we also have a guide on contributing to circuit python using git and github as well as the fact that we're always available on discord to help out 
So don't let the process intimidate you. If you are interested in contributing, we are here to help. In terms of library updates in the last seven days, there is one new library, Adafruit Circuit Python BLE Beacon, and a number of updated libraries that are listed in the notes, but I won't read them off individually. That's what I've got. Awesome, thank you, Katni. Uh, next up, we will hear from maker Melissa telling us about the Blinka repository. <coughs> Hello. Uh, so Blinka is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. And this week we had four pull requests merged by two authors and one reviewer. There are currently six open pull requests. There was one closed issue by one person and two open by one person. And that leaves a net of 84 open issues. There were 12,680 Pi Wheels downloads in the last month. And we are currently at 91 boards. And that's it. Awesome. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, next up, we will get started on the first of our round robins, the Hug Reports section. Uh, Hug Reports is a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. I'll start, and then we'll go down the list alphabetically to give everyone a chance to participate. Uh, if you're text only or missing the meeting, but have Hug Reports in the notes document, then I will read them off as we get to you in the list. Uh, so my hug reports this week, thank you to uh, C. Grover for making and sharing a palette, excuse me, fa uh, palette filter library that makes it easier to manage uh, transparency color indexes inside of DisplayIO uh, palette objects. That's a super neat utility that I think we'll be able to get lots of interesting stuff done with. Um, and then a hug report to TC Franks, thank you uh, that they have submitted uh, many, many different typing PRs. They've been on a tear of typing PRs lately, as well as other improvements across the library. So definitely appreciate their uh, contributions. Uh, next up is C. Grover, who's text only. So I'll read theirs. Uh, Hug Report to Tectric for the speedy review and merge of a community bundle submittal. Uh, Hug Report to Foamy Guy, uh, me, for testing the Pallet Filter Library. And hug report to Paul Cutler and Todd Bott for the first in a hopefully long series of the Bootloader podcasts. Uh, walked away from today's episode with a couple of cool nuggets. Uh, thank you, C. Grover, for putting those hug reports in. And next up is Dan. Hey, thanks. Um, uh, first, uh, thanks to Snakey Maker Cat for their first two PRs, which were adding file name support direct file name support for WAV file and MP3 decoder. Thanks to Jeff for taking a break from Pico W to fix some 800 bugs. That's very much appreciated. Uh, thanks, uh, as Jeff mentioned, uh, Katni and Jeff and I had a bug and triage meeting uh, last week and that was really helpful, in reducing the number of things we really need to do. We, we think we, we have to do for 800. Thanks to Jeff for making great progress on the Pico W implementation. That's look, working out very nicely, it seems. And thanks to Microdev, finally, for a bunch of PRs and reviews of other PRs and some other and other contributions of various kinds. OK. Thanks, Dan. Uh, next up is David Glauda, uh, who's not speaking, so I'll read. Uh, hug report to Todd Bott and Paul Cutler for the new Bootloader podcast. Uh, hug report to Jeff for the progress on the Pico W. Uh, hug report to Anik Data for the HTTP server example. Hug report to maker Melissa for uh, treating my circuitpython.org PR, um, probably reviewing or testing maybe. Um, hug report to AT Maker's Bill for helping produce uh, his USB filter hardware slash software. And lastly, hug report to Phil B for making it possible to use the Papyrus font on PCBs made with Eagle. So next up is EJ Devon 3 who's not present, so I will read. Uh, they have a hug report to me, uh, Foamy Guy, for hosting the meeting. Hug report to C. Grover and Foamy Guy for advancing CircuitPython graphical capabilities. It's been a lot of fun seeing all sorts of new possibilities take shape. Uh, hug report for Todd Bot and Paul Cutler for hosting their first episode of the Bootloader podcast. They shared some interesting stuff that uh, DJ Devon had no idea about. Hug report to Lady Ada for designing a really neat step switch breakout. The footprint alone should help synthaholics with their PCB designs. Uh, hug report to Jepler for launching the Pico W demo during show and tell. Uh, really exciting development. 
And lastly, hug report to Neerdoc and Toddbot for helping with some code that got my step sequencer working. Uh, Python zip isn't for zipping files. The zip class uh, is exactly what I was looking for. And so next up uh, is Jeff. Hello. Uh, yeah, first I'd like to give a hug report to the Pico SDK and MicroPython authors who I don't know individually uh, for all the groundwork on the Pico wireless networking that I built on. And uh, this isn't written in the document right this second, but uh, thanks to everybody who's giving me some recognition for this. I really appreciate that in this work, people notice what I'm doing and thank me for it. That's I know that's why we do hug reports, but it's really nice to hear. Um, and I want to particularly thank uh, some community members who've given me feedback on the in progress PR and on the related issue. And the two that I spotted when I was just reviewing it really quickly, uh, this is not an exhaustive list, were Anecdata and Bill 88T. And finally, to Tectric, thank you for fixing the milestone reporting for State of Circuit Python, even if you are the one that broke it in the first place. Um, I think without looking that that code is probably in a better place than it was before uh, you started breaking things. So keep it up. And uh, that's what I've got. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, next up, we'll hear from Katni. Hello. So my first hug report is to Argon Blue from Discord, who recently became a community helper uh, on the Adafruit Discord server and has been helping out in so many places. Um, they're filling out that role in so many ways, and I continue to be impressed. Um, the thing that sparked this was that they have thoughtful and very informed answers in many, many different genres, um, many different topics that are not similar. So uh, I'm always kind of blown away when they pop up again in, a, um, in another channel with another great answer. Um, to Naradoc for helping me out with some questions that potentially eliminated me needing to do a PR. I did look back into it. I think I do need to do a PR, but um, there was some stuff that I had completely forgotten about and was looking at it completely wrong. So Naradoc absolutely helped that out. Um, to Tammy Makes Things for always being available for a chat, whether it's needed or simply wanted. And a group hug to everyone else. This community is amazing. Um, I'm so glad to be a part of it. I'm so glad to have joined. I'm so glad to now be leading it. Um, I appreciate everything everybody does. So thank you very much. Great, great stuff. Thank you, Katni. Um, next up is maker Melissa. Um, yeah, I wanted to give a tag report to Jepler for trying to help me figure out the serial port speed and whether it uh, was always the same in CircuitPython and group hug to everyone else. Awesome. Thanks, Mecca Melissa. Uh, next up is Mark Gambler, who is lurking or text only. Uh, so they have a hug. Uh, Mark does for Neerdoc for random answers to a few questions all last week and anecdata for one as well. Uh, and then next up is Tammy Makes Things. Thanks. So I just have a group hug to everybody for being awesome. Well, thank you, Tammy. Uh, and next up and rounding out the hug reports section is Tectric. Yep. So uh, a group hug, or sorry, well, I guess we'll start there. A group hug to everyone. Um, a hug report to you for me, Guy, and to Katni for helping me navigate issues as a reviewer. Um, you and the community at large has been always pretty great and awesome at uh, providing support to to me across all parts of the contribution process, so um, much appreciated. A hug report to Naradoc for teaching me that the RP2040 can use Blinka uh, and stopping me from giving... Uh, bad, wrong advice to someone on GitHub, on a GitHub issue, so thank you. Uh, and to TC Franks, um, as mentioned earlier, for keeping up with the type annotation PRs. Uh, it's super awesome to see that number of missing type annotation PRs dwindle down closer and closer to zero every week. All right, thank you, Tectric. Um, and that finishes up the Hug Reports section. So next up, we will do the status updates. Uh, status updates is our time to sync up on what we're doing. I will start 
and we'll go through the list alphabetically to give everyone a chance to participate. When I call on you, take a couple of minutes to talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what you'll be doing until the next meeting. This is also an opportunity to provide tips and tricks relevant to what people are working on. If a discussion becomes too much for status updates, uh, then we can move it down to the final section in the weeds. So I'll get started on our status updates. Uh, my status updates for this week, I implemented an option for a horizontal line uh, in the middle of the flip clock sprites um, inside the generator. There's now a new flag you can pass to enable and disable the horizontal line that kind of looks like the fold in the middle of the clock. Um, I resolved the remaining pilot and pre-commit issues to get that library prepared to add to the bundle. I tested out and showed off Seagrover's palette filter library on Deep Dive last week. And um, I updated the MPY file size actions task. That's a uh, open PR on the cookie cutter. Uh, but we've also been doing some testing on one of my own forks of one of the libraries. That has been updated now based on feedback from uh, last week's meeting to uh, compare the size with the current main branch rather than the MPY file that is currently in the released uh, bundle when it makes those comparisons to post comments on the PRs. Um, so that change is now in as well as one other change that adds a summary section um, with some of the high level stats and differences uh, about the changed library. Uh, next up is C. Grover, who is text only, so I will read. Uh, shifting back to the Eurorack range slicer module refactoring, converting it to a state driven approach. Uh, we'll also investigate async IO and its impact on time critical events. Submitted a palette filter library to the community bundle. Its primary purpose is to convert a range of color values based on a visible spectrum algorithm to a replacement color value or to transparency. Planning to develop additional DisplayIO palette tools, perhaps a palette optimizer to reduce palette size by calling unused or duplicate palette index entries, uh, stuff like that. The line is beginning to blur between bitmap tools and palette tools. Um, and the last thing that Seagrover has got is that fall yard work continues, removing more lawn, pouring concrete, and moving a ridiculously large pile of decorative rock the goal is to reduce water consumption and waste by another 50%. Definitely sounds nice. Uh, next up, we will hear from Dan. Okay, thanks. So um, I was off for a few days last week, um, away from away from work. I came back on Sunday and reviewed a bunch of uh, pending PRs and kind of contributed to stuff that that kind of stuff. What I'll be doing starting after the meeting is I'm going to be testing uh, power consumption during deep sleep. Uh, we have kind of a lot of variation in how much power boards use when they go into deep sleep. And I added a feature to turn, to flip pins into certain states, to hold pins and into in certain states when you go into deep sleep, but it's not getting the power down to the level that I might expect on some boards. So I'm going to investigate that. And the other thing to do is probably just to make an 800 beta 1 because it's been several weeks or maybe even a month or a couple of months. I, I don't know. And uh, we may as well catch up. Sometimes I like wait for a big thing to go in, but it's probably it's actually not worth it because it just makes the release notes longer and longer and longer. So maybe I'll make a release sometime this week. Okay. All right. Thanks, Dan. Uh, next up is David Glauda, who's not speaking, so I will read. Uh, finishing the external display PR for circuitpython.org based on the re results of the vote during last week's meeting. Uh, long exchange with AT Maker's Bill to replicate his USB filter, uh, which is a trinket doing USB host in Arduino uh, to convert essentially over U UART back to a CircuitPython board, uh, in this case a QtPy RP2040. That trinket will read data coming from the USB device and send it over to the CircuitPython QtPy um, or, or any CircuitPython device. Um, installing Eagle and Arduino 2.0 to be ready to adapt uh, and replicate. Documenting the, let's see, documenting in gist some of my research notes before closing all the tabs. We've got some stuff for USB host uh, in CircuitPython and alternative. 
uh, P2S, no, PS2IO support in CircuitPython. Uh, PS2 dev, how to pretend to be a PS2 keyboard with Arduino. So if anybody is interested in any of those things, uh, David has compiled some notes together and put links over to GIST uh, inside the notes doc. Next up is DJ Devin 3 who's not present, so I'll read. Uh, Alora Messenger, still on the back shelf. No progress on that one this week. Um, designed a new version 1.2 of the Stex step sequencer called the TR Cowbell. It now has a Stemma connector, Stemma breakout, uh, 9 GPIO breakout. Uh, it runs on the Raspberry Pi Pico. Uh, learn, let's see, learned how to use a font as a solder mask layer so that the font is exposed copper. Got a hardware test functioning thanks to Toddbot giving a hint to use the zip class. Watching all the little lights sequentially running made me giddy and to do a happy dance. Uh, it's got papyrus font on the back. It was tested with and runs on CircuitPython beautifully. Uh, pretty sure I ironed out all the major hardware bugs and ordered 20 PCBs. They should arrive in about two weeks. Uh, there are some very nice photos of this uh, board, this custom board with all of its artwork in the note stock as well. If anybody is interested in uh, PCB artwork, there's some great stuff over there to check out. Um, the last thing from DJ Devon mentions Hurricane Ian is on its way to Florida, and it looks like it might be. Uh, it looks like DJ Devon might be getting hit along with millions of other Floridians. I'm on the East Coast, uh, East Coast, so less of a worry, but still might lose power and be out of commission for an unspecified amount of time as I deal with cleanup. Pretty sure the Ruiz brothers are in the same boat. Hunker down and stay safe, of course, to everyone in Florida or anywhere where there is inclement weather, certainly. Uh, next up is Jeff. All right. So last week, uh, I published a draft pull request for Pico W Wi-Fi support. There is no SSL or HTTPS support yet. There is no support for servers yet, and it needs stability improvements. But we are ready for you to test and report your results. Grab the UF2 from the actions of the pull request and leave your uh, comments at the issue 6558 on the CircuitPython repository. Besides that, I made pull requests for several issues blocking the 800 release. I need to go back and check the status of all those and make sure there's not something I need to finish on them. I have completed the code and text for my next guide, a Tandy 1000 keyboard to USB converter using CircuitPython and QtPy RP2040. And I investigated using Python to pre-process static cruft out of libraries before MPY compiling. And while doing that, I ran into a project called AST Monkey, which will um, essentially let you parse a whole Python module into a high-level representation, make changes to it, and uh, then write it back out. Um, and that AST is abstract. Sin abstract syntax tree. I hope I said that right. Anyway, the code had some bugs and I was able to fix some of them, so I put out a pull request for that. This week I will finish and publish the guide. I want to get it done before the end of the month because Tandy aficionados designate this month as the month of Septandy. Um, my last 800 bug that is assigned to me is a reported SDIO problem on the Grand Central M4, so I need to test reproduce and fix that and then I will return to the Pico W work. First up, um, bug fixes. If any of the, well, it, some of the time it will fail after doing a certain number of things and then it won't work until you power cycle it. And that's a clear bug probably in my code. Um, some of the other stuff, I will work on replicating it in MicroPython. And if a similar problem exists in both platforms, then it's time to say to upstream, can you look at this? Um, once that is merged, oh, and I need to add support for servers. Once that's merged, I am going to investigate into the feasibility of support for SSL, including HTTPS connections. Based on my quick survey, it looks like the Pico SDK does not have support for this. And MicroPython support is limited to having a certificate for one single server that um, you just put in a file on the drive. And that's quite different from what we do with the ESP32, where we have the whole set of 
certificates very similar to what your desktop browser would have. And if we can't do that with the Pico because of the flash size, we'll have to either punt or come up with some kind of plan B. But that I need to investigate uh, before I throw in the towel on that. But that, those, are, those are the hurdles that come ahead. Anyway, and for the future, the next keyboard on deck is the next non-ADB keyboard. And there was a guide previously done a decade ago on Arduino by Lady Ada herself. So I've kind of got a really uh, direct path to, to the endpoint because I'll be able to study that code and just re-implement it in CircuitPython on the RP2040. So it should be fun, but it'll be three or four weeks till that guide comes out because other stuff is going to be on the front burners for a while. That's it. Excellent. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, next up is Katni. All right. So last week, I uh, tested the MCP9600 breakout uh, it's temperature sensor frequency options due to a vague comment in the simple test that said frequency must be set for this to work. And then the next comment said, if you receive, if you get IO errors, try changing the frequency. It didn't explain what frequencies to try, uh, or what the context was. Um, and I, vaguely remembered it and I th think I had no idea what was going on with it but I was told that so I added that comment verbatim um, with no background understanding. So the point is I, I did not have anything to bring to the table when told to find out what other frequencies worked. Um, it turns out uh, on the M4 um, no other frequencies worked except for the default because the chip couldn't go over 100 kilohertz and the circuit python on uh, m4 doesn't support very far under 100 kilohertz so the more we looked into it um carter helped me out um we realized that it may be just a pi issue raspberry pi issue so we ended up removing the comment altogether adding a warning in the guide about the pi clock stretching with a link to our pi clock stretching guide page um, in the process of this, I also realized the documentation and guide explanation for the delta temperature feature were atrocious. Uh, yes, I wrote both. And so I updated both of them to be significantly more informative and clear. Um, next up, I was supposed to do the stomach QT revision of the quad alphanumeric backpack uh, next, but needed verification on where the update was supposed to go. So instead, I started on the LTR329 and LTR303 breakouts guide. Same chip, 303 has an int pin. Uh, got through a couple of pages there. The LTR329 was delivered, but the 303 was not yet in stock. Um, found out where I was supposed to put the QT revision, so I put aside the LTR guide and uh, started on the QT revision um, of the alphanumeric backpack, and I'm about two-thirds of the way through that. So this week, um, the backpack... QT update needs updated wiring diagrams and then the applicable pages updated with those diagrams. Uh, and then that, I believe, is it for that. I will be testing uh, CircuitPython issue 6676 because I am 98% certain the issue reported was something I did in my last project and I had no issues with it. So I'm going to go back and test it with a smaller script because my obviously my code was pretty complicated. Um, test it with a smaller script and see whether or not the issue is still present. It's possible we fixed it, close the issue if it's resolved. Then I'm going to pick back up with the LTR3X guide, um, and the LTR303 breakouts are on my porch. Following that, I'll be adding the Metro Mini V2 to the Metro Mini guide, and beyond that, my next quest is a mystery. That's what I've got. Awesome. Thank you, Katni. Uh, next up is Maker Melissa. Hello. Last week I fixed the BLE connectivity issues in the code editor. I started working on the USB workflow after that, though it's proving to be a little more troublesome than I thought it'd be. And um, I'm helping, I helped Brent troubleshoot why a whippersnapper little FS partition was no longer working. We got that all working good on the ESP32 boards. Uh, this week I am working on trying to wrap up the USB workflow. It's actually pretty close now, but I'm currently stuck on finding a reliable way 
to detect if the user hits cancel on the file dialog. Um, after that, I'll fix the BLE upload issues, and then I'll get all the recent changes bundled up and made live. And other than that, I've finally finished a huge sorting project with all my electronics and 3D printing stuff, and I'm working on moving it all out of my office by the end of the week. And that's it. Excellent. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, next up is Paul Cutler. Tim. Uh, last week I recorded an episode of the podcast with Jim Muzared from MicroPython. That was fun talking to him. Um, this week, thanks to thanks for everyone's comments and listening to the new show, The Bootloader with Todd Bot. That's out today. And then later this week I'll be taking the CircuitPython show on the road. I'll be driving about 90 miles east to Wisconsin uh, for a special Halloween episode, so keep your eyes up, open for that. And then I'll be at the community help desk this Thursday with Tech Trick, and next week I'll be out because I'm having very minor hand surgery. Thanks. All right, thanks, Paul. Definitely uh, hope for a speedy recovery there of your hand. Next up is Tammy Makes Things. Hi. Right, so last week, <clears throat> um, last week I didn't work on Circuit Python stuff a whole lot. My day job was ridiculous because two weeks ago we had no internal meetings week in my company and so last week turned into all of the internal meetings week and I had like 32 meetings which is um, a lot of meetings but I worked a bit on the issue I was running into with circup and extended attribute files on Mac OS Ventura beta um, I discovered that Mac OS has an X atter command which removes or manipulates the extended attributes on files and the xatter python module installs its own xatter script with different command line arguments so i need to test whether getting the xatter modules version of the commands out of my search path helps the issue that i've been seeing and if not i'll move forward with the fix that i'm working on um so i'm going to do that this week i'm also carving out some time for pr reviews and figuring out that issue and i think I finally have a workaround for the Mac OS Ventura issue that broke my OBS and is currently preventing me from streaming, so hopefully I can get that fixed. Um, and that's what I got. All right, thanks, Tammy. Uh, next up in rounding out the status updates is Tectric. Yep, so last week I set up OBS and prepared for the Community Help Desk stream this Thursday. Um, Shout out uh, to, I think, Katney, who helped me figure out uh, the file format um, needed so that if slash when my computer decides to uh, shut down and stop recording, that I won't lose everything, I think. Um, I fixed an issue, uh, again, caused by me, where Adabot wasn't reporting open issues for all the milestones. Um, I finalized and added my first library to the Adafruit Circuit Python bundle, which is the new BLE Beacon library um, for working with Bluetooth beacons. Currently, it allows uh, for use with iBeacons. Uh, I added the ability to Blinka for uh, to update the Dunder version attribute before uploading to PyPI, similar to the libraries. Uh, additionally, Blinka also now builds a pure Python wheel. Uh, which should cut down on uh, both the install and setup time when you're installing via pip. I continued working on the GitHub action for creating MyPy files for releases, um, the intended uses for personal projects where you can uh, release it and it will compile all of your code so uh, and attach it to the release, um, similar to the way the, the libraries do it. And in terms of personal projects, I wrote some of my first real bash scripts uh, for uploading firmware and software to a QDPI S2, um, which is uh, going to be helpful for my CircuitPython Nukia uh, project. Um, when I start making a bunch, it'll be really easy to automate the build process, um, if I can do that. This week, um, as mentioned, I'm hosting the Community Help Desk this Thursday to help people get set up uh, for Hacktoberfest. Um, I'll walk through the whole process, so um, from signing up for Hacktoberfest to looking at some, or pointing to some guides for getting started with Git and GitHub um, and whatnot, so um, if you're interested, tune in. I'll try to go over everything. 
reviewing all of the outstanding type annotation PRs is also on my list this week. I'm going to continue working on that GitHub action for adding MyPy files to releases. And if there's time, I'm hoping to revive some of the work I previously did to add the image transfer functionality to the Bluefruit Connect library. I almost deleted all my progress during the cleanup of my repositories and a totally intentional reinstall of my operating system, but luckily the microcontroller I previously used for testing had the code, so working as intended. Nice, thank you, Tectric. I've uh, definitely been saved by that more than once myself as well. Um, all right, so that is it for status updates this week. Uh, so next up in our final section is called In the Weeds. In the Weeds is an opportunity for more long form discussions. These can either have come out of status updates or they can be identified by folks ahead of time. If you have any In the Weeds topics, please make sure they get added uh, down at the bottom of the note stock. It looks like we do have a couple. If anyone else has uh, any more, then please do go ahead and add those now so we're not waiting around once we get to the end. Um, the first In the Weeds topic is from David, who's not speaking, so I'll read this one. Uh, should we have a camera? Should we have camera as a feature on circuitpython.org? Uh, and if so, what board? Please have a look at this issue. Uh, speak out or put comment on it once. Uh, speak out or put a comment on it, and once the dust settles, then David will make a PR for it. So that is over on circuitpython.org. Let's see if we can link this one. Chat there. Um, and I don't know if anybody else has thoughts on this. My, uh, the first thing that comes to mind for me though is that I don't, I'm not aware of any devices that have a camera built in. Um, so I would probably lean towards not including camera as a feature listed on circuitpython.org unless or until uh, we do have a device where the camera is built in. Uh, but that's just my take on it, and I could also be wrong about that device not existing. So, so there are a couple of devices with a camera built in. Um, there's a an as yet unreleased Adafruit device. There is there are two development kits from Espressive, and then there's a third development kit from Espressive that has a standard header for a camera. But that's a total of about four boards. Um, Three if you don't count the unreleased one. Two if you don't count um, the the one that only has a header. And I think you know ha having fewer than one percent of boards have a feature means we probably shouldn't list that feature yet. Um, <laughs> so uh, for now, I would defer any action on that personally. That's just my two cents. Um, and the presence board was mentioned. It's there's a separate camera and there's a carrier board for this presence. Oh, Which that's true. I do have camera. that board. Yeah. It does have support in CircuitPython, and I've never tried it. So three boards yeah, yeah. that are manufactured and have a, a camera option. Right. I mean, it's partly you can tell because there are built-in modules in most cases. That was yeah. going to be my question was, are there built-in modules specific to the camera functionality? I did test out one, yeah. once, but I don't recall. There are, now th there are now three different ones. Okay. So um, for RP2040 or for uh, Grand Central M4, there's image capture. For Espressive boards in version 8, there's ESP32 <laughs> camera. And then the uh, Spresence board has a different API. So there are three APIs for camera which isn't great, but that's the way it is right now. OK. But those at least are shown, presumably, as the um, built-in library. So people do have a way to discover which devices they can work on today, even if we don't have that listed as a feature specifically. Okay. Uh, anybody else have any thoughts or ideas around the camera feature for circuitpython.org? Not for now. OK. Uh, Next up, I will pass it over to Tectric, who's got our other in the weeds topic, or our second in the weeds topic, I should say. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, uh, so I just, uh, it's relating to a PR I submitted, um, and it's really just checking if there's any kind of issue with this PR, which is um, API breaking. Um, it's for the 
uh, mini MQTT library. Um, what it does is it sets the um, init function to use, I think, um, without looking at it, I think all uh, keyword-only arguments provided. Um, the idea there is that there are currently just a lot of uh, arguments provided, so forcing them to be uh, keyword-only um, prevents mixing up some of them, um, especially ones where I think there's like a couple timeout ones, so you want to make sure that you put put them where they go, where you want them to go. Um, as a note, I believe I checked the libraries and the guides that use it, and I couldn't find any uses uh, where they were being used with positional arguments. I know the guides in particular are currently using keyword, ar keyword argument only, or keyword arguments, so... But I didn't know if it was used anywhere else or if this is going to be a problem, so I just kind of wanted to ask more publicly. Okay, so there are also other libraries that rely on this library, I think. Yep, I think it's um, I.O. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now, though. Um, like, looking at a, a, a guide that you, that's Adafruit I.O., and it's not there. Um... So maybe I'm mistaken, or maybe this this guide is 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 kind of old. So maybe um maybe it does now. Um, but we would need to make sure that the implementation in the libraries for which it is a dependency are also not gonna break. Um. And you said you you looked that up, Tactric. Yeah, I, I I looked it up. Uh, the PI has been out for a little bit, so I did it uh, a little bit ago. But when I looked at the libraries, I believe that they were not um, that that they all used keyword arguments. So they're all okay. specifying their their arguments um, already. So I would say this is fine then. Um, the big key is that when you release it, you need to do a major version change. Um, mm -hmm. which is how we indicate that it's basically a, a breaking change or that there's some vastly new feature or something like that. But in this case, you, you, for, for breaking changes, you always want to do a major version bump. So if it's, you know, 4.2.1 at the moment, do a 5.0.0, um, and, uh, put in the, uh, notes, um, why it's a breaking change and perhaps even put in the release title that it's a you know, API breaking change. Um, and then that's about the best we can do. Um, is there documentation in it that needs to be updated? No, I, I don't believe so. I think all of the arguments are, are specified. Um, okay. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's, I think that that was the only new change. Um, okay. Well, um, I say, I say do it. Um, do it as I just suggested and then keep an eye out for, you know, for, for things that break. Um, yeah, no, I, I can definitely do that. And that way, you know, we're at least we're aware of it. So it's not uh, a surprise. Um, but I would say I would say go for it. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll triple check to make sure that, okay. that nothing's gonna get on, especially the libraries aren't gonna break. Um, yep. But yeah, if so, I'll do that then. Thanks. Sweet, thank you. All right, yep, thank you, Tech. Uh, yeah? I, I, I have a question. Can you, is it possible to, to uh, load a previous version of, of a library? Yep. From um, PyPy? Uh, well, from PyPy, you can, Pi but you I... need to specify yeah. uh, I think you do like equals equals in the name, if I recall right. So like ordinarily it would be like, you know, pip install Adafruit CircuitPython mini MQTT. You would do like pip install Adafruit CircuitPython mini MQTT equals equals and then the version you want. And that would match the release tag that you can find on the releases pages on GitHub. Speaking of the releases page on GitHub, the MPY file will also be uploaded to there as well. So that may turn out to be easier depending on your familiarity with PyPy. Um, you can just download the MPY from the old release page and then copy that to your device as well. Yeah, because I have a, a couple of uh, projects that use uh, use the current version of 
mini QTT before all these changes started to happen. So I just wanted to make sure I could temporarily uh, absolutely include uh, both, both using so that I can. Yeah, both using PyPI oh, I and um, Circuit Python. Obviously, you can go to the to the releases page and download previous versions as well. So you you'll have access to all of that. It's not going anywhere. Okay, so good. That's that's all I wanted to know. Thank okay. you. Mm -hmm. uh, and next up, and our last in the weeds topic is from Dan. Thanks. Um, so it was brought up. An issue came up. Uh, Sixty nine thirty. Um, uh, which is is like the, to no, noting that there the BLE implementation in Espressif is partial because it's only peripheral, perif BLE peripherals. And if you try to use that as a central, you get a not implemented error. This is implement. This is mentioned like in the learn guide, um, but it's not really mentioned anywhere else, and. Uh, I think the user said it wasn't in the um, read the docs. So this is kind of an example, a specific example of a more general problem that there are limitation, known limitations on certain boards, even if they do have certain modules listed in CircuitPython.org. And the question is, where would we put these kinds of limitations? They could go and read the docs. They could go only in the learn guides. They could go on the board page on circuitpython.org. Um, all of those places, when, when someone buys a board, sometimes they say, I was thought I bought a board to do X, and it turns out it doesn't do that. And um, they would have had to sort of study something, maybe the learn guide most specifically, but in general, they might not know. Or another example, which is kind of um, comes up is that people buy an M0, a SAMD21 board, and they find out that it just doesn't have enough RAM to do what they want. That's kind of a more general problem. But how might we document these kinds of limitations and where might they go? Maybe they need to go in multiple places. Right now, it's basically done by hand in the learn guide. So I was wondering whether people have any ideas about this. I do think read the docs definitely makes sense, um, but I don't think it's necessarily like as an alternative to the learn guides. I think it should definitely be noted there as well because the learn guides are typically linked from mm -hmm. the product pages. And I think there's lots of folks who know and are familiar with how to find and read the learn guides, but maybe not quite as familiar with how to find and read the read the docs pages. Um, but I do think read the docs would be a great place to list it. So in this place, in this case, it'd be in the inline um, doc strings inside the core, I think. So if should it should they be should it be obviously obvious on the board page that there is this limitation or would you have to click on the module? Suppose here's the, like in this example, you'd have to know to click on underscore BLEIO to find out that in fact it's only half of a BLE implementation. Um, it seems to me that it would be good for it to be, I mean, it could be in the product description. We don't have a lot of control over the product descriptions. Um, I mean, we do. We just we, need we, to. We personally can't edit them. Yeah, yeah, but we need to inform the folks who can. Yeah. I think the product description would be a, a really important place to put it because that's, people aren't going and reading the support matrix, right? Like when they yeah. go to buy a board, like they're reading the product description and it says, you know, oh, BLE supported and then, it doesn't make it clear what's going on with that. And I, like, I, I know what you're talking about. I, I've, I've yeah. run into this on Discord folks complaining about that. Like, oh, it said that BLE was supported, but it looks like it's not. You know, I'll, I'll use Wi-Fi, but that's disappointing. And I'm like, oof. Yeah. So I, I think it should be multiple places. And maybe we there needs to be some kind of I mean, it can be in read the docs, it can be on CircuitPython, or it can be in the product description. The product description is not maintained, right? It's maintained by hand, like the yeah. learn guides. So, and, and if we, for instance, we did implement uh, 
say, BLE Central, we'd have to change a lot of product descriptions. Maybe that's just something well, that... I, I don't know that we need to get that specific. Yeah. Like, there's, there's a couple boards that it, in, in the product description, it, it, it literally says, BLE is supported, also it supports CircuitPython. That's unclear. Yeah, I agree. So we could reword that. Or like CircuitPython BLE is currently in beta. Like, yeah, we would have to go back. But like those, the, I, I don't think it has to apply to all of the BLE boards. Like not, not the product description changes, I mean. Um, just specifically to the ones that are kind of misleading at the moment. Okay. I right. don't think they all are. All right. Because there's a lot of copy paste, copy pasting. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think there's some kind of internal thing about Maybe the product description should be more, they should have mirrored paragraphs or something. We don't really know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's yeah. tough. Yeah, it is. It is right. It's not going to happen. To change up that whole either. system, just like it's tough to change up any whole system that we're dealing with at the moment. Yeah. But um, it might also be in the board on the circuitpython.org page for the board. Yeah. And I, I, I do think agree with that. that. That we have control over and that we could add. It's often per port. Uh, it could be per board. So there could be a file, a text file per port or per board that gets sucked in to the circuitpython org dash org uh, build process and yeah. put in as a separate gray box or something like that. That would or, be. Or at the end of the different. description or something. I don't know. I, so I think it's worth thinking about. Yeah. I mean, I'll end up opening an issue, maybe, but that's a good. I'm glad. Yeah, I'm. I'm glad that this 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 seems to make sense to you. We do make. We do need something like this. I think. And right. As 100%. as as we have more and more things that are not not fully implemented. Partial, right. And yeah. the same thing is true of like ESP32, S3. Oh, the I2C doesn't work all the time. That would be nice. Yeah, but, and like C3, you know. Yeah. Yeah. As well with what we don't have going on there. Exactly, exactly. So, all right, so I'll think about this a little bit and uh, maybe it'll happen eventually <laughs> okay. in some way. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have anything, suggestions? All right, Th that was the kind of discussion I wanted to, to generate. All right, thanks, Dan. Um, I'll just read uh, Seagrover's remark. Uh, Seagrover suggests we need a pretty pins or badges approach to included features and CircuitPython modules. I think it would be great. Visual things are great. So something to keep in mind, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, and Naradoc says, in general, the shop page should also say CircuitPython support is in alpha. There might be missing, missing features and instability on C3 and S3 and C3 and the like, such as it used to say on the Feather. STM32. Yeah, and I agree with that. And I, we can we can inform. There are people who maintain the new products pages, and we can just send them emails about this. So we can do that at least to start. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. For sure. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. Um, let's see. Let me get back to the notes doc here. So uh, that was our last in the weeds topic. Uh, so we will wrap it up. Um, as a reminder to everyone, this has been the CircuitPython Weekly Meeting for September 26th. Thank you to everyone who participated. Uh, if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython and those of us that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit, and the podcast will be made available on major podcast services. Uh, it will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers hey. newsletter. Uh, you can visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe to that. The next meeting will be held at the usual time next Monday, uh, which is the 3rd of October uh, at the standard 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. Um, so we hope to see you there. Uh, it'll be on the Adafruit Discord, same as this meeting, adafru.it slash discord. And if you'd like to get notified about the meetings or any changes to the upcoming days or times, uh, you can ask to be added to the CircuitPythonistas role on Discord. We'll always make sure to ping that role with any changes to uh, the meeting. But uh, as a reminder, we are set for the normal time next week, uh, Monday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, so we hope to see you all next week. Thank you, everyone, for participating.
Thanks, everyone.